morning. First, thanks for your patience as we started a little late today, uh, but had lots of good family business. And if you missed it, uh, we're moving into our new building at the end of April. So it's soon. Yeah. Well, today we're beginning our final series as we've been walking through this, this gospel of Luke. And way back in December, we started with Luke the Nativity and we saw the, the, this incredible birth of Jesus, fully human and fully divine. Then the last weeks we've been in Luke the Mission and we've watched Jesus teach and we've watched Jesus heal and we've watched Jesus gather around him a bunch of apprentices to help him carry on the mission. And now finally, we, as we get ready to walk to Easter, we are to Luke the Passion. That's an interesting word. You know, long before some of the, uh, the meanings of the word passion that might come to your mind, passion was connected to Jesus. The word passion comes from the Latin word passio, which actually means suffering. Passion first meant Jesus walked to the cross. It meant Jesus being abandoned and Jesus being betrayed and Jesus being beat and mocked and Jesus being crucified and dying and him being separated from his father. He suffered for you and me. He suffered so that we could come back to God. He took our sin on himself so that we could be forgiven of our sins and we could live the life that we were meant to live. You first see this word passio in a Latin version of the Bible from the second century. And it describes the, the death of Jesus. It uses that word to describe it. And of course, throughout the years, the use of passion has played a, a, a role in, in the minds and the imaginations of artists. So Joh Johann Sebastian Bach, he wrote, the passions. He composed a passion for every single one of the Gospels, all telling about the suffering of Jesus. Rembrandt, he painted many paintings and series of paintings, all called the Passion. Again, to show the suffering of Jesus, to help us grapple with what was that like and why did the God of the universe send his son to suffer for us? And of course, many of you will remember in 2004 that uh, Mel Gibson produced uh, this movie, the, the Passion of the Christ. Over the years, though, passion has taken on a lot of different meanings. And it, it's taken on a, a kind of a, a deep emotions, our affections and our attractions. And Shakespeare was actually the first one to use passion in that way. He had a character of his that he said pleaded his passions for the one he loved. But it's interesting, those two uses of passion are really easily connected. Today we talk about being passionate about causes. We talk about having passion for the one we love. So as we start this series today, I can say to you that Jesus is passionate about the world. And Jesus has passion for you. But at the heart of his passion is his suffering. See, Jesus always intended to give his life for you. That was the only way that your life and God was going to be reconnected. It was the only way. So really, his mission was to give his life and to suffer you for you. The mission is the passion. Through the last weeks as we've been talking about that mission, as we've been watching it unfold, uh, Jesus is literally walking towards Jerusalem and is on his way to the cross and to, to suffering. He told the disciples over and over again that this is the way it was going to be. But now finally it's time. And it was a very specific time. Right in the middle of Passover, this Jewish holiday to celebrate rescue. Thousands were on their way to Jerusalem. This was a high holy moment to make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And as all these travelers were, were walking that way, here was Jesus 
going into Jerusalem with them, and Jesus was riding on a donkey. See, there was this excitement about Jesus already building. We've talked about that. They'd seen him heal. They'd seen him teach. And he was someone they could believe in. They had been waiting for someone to rescue them. They'd been waiting for someone to be the king in the line of David who would save them. And here was Jesus riding into Jerusalem. They wanted a king, but did they want this king? Here's how Luke tells this story. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now this passage of scripture is in every one of the gospels and it's called the triumphal entry because finally Jesus is announcing who he is and he's announcing why he came and what he's coming to do. He is coming in as king. And we get all these indicators from that passage. The first thing we see is that he comes in on a donkey. Now that was a surprise and that signaled that Jesus was a very different kind of king. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, in a few weeks, uh, we're going to have a donkey come right down this aisle on Palm Sunday. And in the new church, guess what? We're going to do the same thing. And this time, the donkey gets a center aisle. And the donkey's going to come right down the center. Now, when I first brought this tradition to you seven years ago, you thought I was crazy. And now you wouldn't think that we could have Palm Sunday without a donkey. Well, just like you felt that first time we brought a donkey into a sanctuary. That's how these people thought. Like, what in the world, Jesus? What are you doing, Jesus? Why are you riding in on a, a donkey, Jesus? But Jesus had it all planned. A young, unbroken colt of a mother donkey. Two disciples went ahead to get the animal ready and they brought it back to Jesus. Now, everyone wished that Jesus had chosen a majestic horse worthy of a powerful king. But a donkey made a different kind of statement. And it, it was a statement right out of the prophet Zechariah's mouth. The Messiah would come in on a donkey. But of course, that meant that King Jesus would be humble and not warlike. It meant Jesus would be weak and not strong. See, Jesus was trying to tell them, my kingdom is different than you think. Yes, I'm coming into Jerusalem. Yes, I'm coming to save you. But I'm coming in weakness. I'm going to rule and save, but not by taking power and killing but by losing power and dying. Now, the second thing that gives us an indication that the people think something's up here is how they respond to Jesus coming in on the donkey as he gets close to Jerusalem. The donkey didn't take any energy away from the disciples. They, it says, put their cloaks under Jesus. 
So he literally came into Jerusalem on a red carpet of people's cloaks. Now, if you'll throw that slide back up, you'll see that that tradition for the Jews came right out of the Old Testament. This is what you did with kings. So in 2 Kings 9.13, the people lay down their cloaks for King Jehu. This is what you did for kings. Now, interesting, if you've heard the Palm story before, Palm Sunday story before, you go, wait a minute, where are the palms? Where are the hosannas? Well, you see, they're not here. We don't get those. But what we do get is the people singing praise to Jesus, the king. Right out of Psalm 118, 26. Now that is a psalm that the Jews would sing at their Passover festivals. It was a story of how God was good and how God had rescued and that a king was coming in the line of David to save them. So they sang this song with all this hope that Jesus was the king. I mean, finally their nightmare was over. Their persecution was done and their struggles were over. They were going to be saved. But they didn't get it quite right. They were close. Jesus would save them, but just not the way they thought. Now, it's interesting, as we've been reading through the, the gospel of Luke, we've seen that there are many times where people want to put Jesus at the front. They go, ah, oh, now's your time. You're popular and you're powerful, Jesus. So go ahead and go. It, it, let's do it. And Jesus, every time, slips away until now. He is telling everyone, it is time for everyone to know that Jesus is king. But not everyone wants in on King Jesus. As the people are celebrating, the Pharisees are angry. And the tension between Jesus and those Pharisees is building. And here's what they say. Teacher, get your people under control. Rebuke them. Tell those disciples to stop it. And Jesus responds, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. See, what we're learning is Jesus is king, but Jesus is a rejected king. And this is only the beginning of the rejection. But even with the Pharisees saying what they said, Jesus will not back down on his kingship. He will be praised. And there's that funny statement he says, the rocks will cry out. And that's actually from Isaiah 55. It says this, then the mountains and the hills will burst into song before the Lord and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And what Isaiah the prophet is saying, ah, when the king comes, it's gonna be so different. Now I am a, Huge, huge fan of the NFL combine. Anybody watch yesterday? Man, it was incredible. I, I love see, seeing the athletes do their thing. And yesterday, uh, the quarterback prospects put on a show. This is Anthony Richardson. He's the Florida quarterback, and he broke so many records. I mean, he jumped 10 feet, 9 inches in the broad jump. And then he jumped 40 and a half inches in the vertical jump. And if that wasn't enough, he ran the 40 in 4.43 seconds, the fourth fastest time in combine history, no matter what position you're in. And then he got on the field, and oh my goodness, the long balls he threw were so beautiful. Then there's this guy, Will Levis, the Kentucky quarterback. I mean, when he stepped up, it was just art to watch him throw. It was so natural and so easy. I felt like I could have run those 40 yards and just grabbed it. It's pretty. God made those guys, and that's only two of them, to beautifully throw and incredibly jump and run. Now, you might be saying, well, preacher, what does that have to do with rocks crying out? 
Well, rocks were made to be beautiful. Isn't that true? I mean, how many of you ever been on, on a hike uh, on, at the mountains? I bet a bunch of you, right? You go because they're beautiful. We climb the mountains. We hike at the mountains, right? But are rocks made to cry out? See, Jesus is saying here, I'm the king. And everything I make shows my glory. As the king, I make creation sing. I will make rocks cry out. Pharisees, you haven't seen anything yet. Jesus is saying those who are in my kingdom, those who will make me king are in for so much. See, under the kingship of Jesus, the world reaches its full potential. And under the kingship of Jesus, you meet your full potential. See, you were made for Jesus to be your king. Without him, your life will be more like black and white than color. You can keep trying and trying and showing all this effort, but nothing will be the way it's supposed to be. See, everything you have, every skill you have, every passion you have, the way you close the deal at work, the way you do surgery, if you operate, the way you teach and it, people get it, the way you perform on the field like these quarterbacks, the way you're a parent and your kids are growing up and you're delighting in it and you're good at it. All of those things are just a foretaste of what's to be. And all of those things are supposed to point you to me, the king. See, when I'm the king, there is so much more to come. Folks, he's coming back as king, and it's gonna happen. But still, not everyone wanted in. Not then, and not now. I don't know, when I read that story about the Pharisees, I kind of go, I, I kind of put myself in Jesus' shoes and I go, wouldn't it be great if he just went and just got them out of the way? But Jesus didn't do that at all. I mean, Jesus could have snapped his fingers and put the Jews in their place, the Pharisees in their place. But he doesn't damn them. He doesn't, doesn't send them away. In fact, he does just the opposite. Their rejection of him breaks Jesus' heart. Folks, when anybody rejects Jesus, it should break our heart. Here's what Jesus said. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. See, Jesus is king, but I am so glad that Jesus is a weeping king. Jesus weeps over people who aren't connected to him. Jesus weeps over you if you're away from him. Jesus weeps when things in your life happen that you don't know what to do with. Jesus is a weeping king. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. And he rides into the city and he's this humble, weeping king. And he's, he's gotten the praise of all these people as they're pouring into the city. And it's kind of a surprise where he goes first. He goes straight to the temple, to the center of the city. Because that's where all the people are. They've come from everywhere to go to the temple and to make their sacrifices at Passover. And here's what happens. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. 
Now, how does Jesus go from weeping to wrecking? What happened? Well, Jesus gets to the temple, and inside that temple, people were doing so many things other than praying. They were putting all this emphasis on religious things rather than on God. They were putting more emphasis on the building rather than the one who was to be worshipped. See, inside that temple, what's going on is keeping people away from God rather than leading people to God. So Jesus says, no, enough. This is it. See, that day Jesus came and he cleared away everything that would keep people from actually getting to God. And folks, he's still doing that. He will do anything, including giving his life to get us back to the Father. See, Jesus is a turn things upside down king. Now let's get real practical. We've held you a little late today. So you're going to be late in line at Panera or wherever you're going for lunch. Right? But you're going to get home and then you're going to be sitting there. And imagine for a minute that Jesus knocks on your front door and he comes into your house. What would Jesus turn upside down? What is keeping you from moving towards Jesus rather than away from Jesus? What's getting in the way of you making Jesus king of your life? See, he will not settle. He will be the king. He's announcing himself the king that he is. And you can't have another king. If you're going to be following Jesus the king, there's only room for one in your life. And you can't make Jesus the kind of king you want. No, he is the king. And he will want anything that keeps you from him out of your life. Now, the next few weeks, we're going to see the passion of Jesus unfold. And we're going to see that he will do everything for you. But my prayer as we read that and study that together is that you will not underestimate your need for Jesus. See, so many people build their life and build their schedule and build their future without the one thing that can truly make them live. See, you were made for Jesus to be your king. You can't live your life without him. You can't live the life you're supposed to live. Like we said last week, you have to put Jesus on the throne of your life. You have to have him at the center of your life. He's the only one who can quench your thirst. He's the only one who can save your life. He is the king forever. So is he yours. Now Jesus doesn't stop at the temple. Jesus keeps going to the cross. So Jesus is the, the sacrificial king. He was heading towards it. He was heading to fulfilling the plan that God had for him to die. That's the ultimate expression of his kingship. He was running towards it, not away from it. Back on D-Day, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, he desperately wanted to join the forces and watch the Allied invasion of Normandy from the bridge of a battleship in the English Channel. Eisenhower was desperate to stop him because he was afraid that the prime minister might be killed. Back and forth they went, would he go, would he not go? And when it was apparent that Churchill wasn't backing down, he was going, Eisenhower appealed to a higher authority, King George. And King George brought Churchill into his office and, and said, well, if it is your duty as prime minister to be there, 
then it's also my duty as the king to join you on that battleship. And at that point, Churchill knew that he had to back down. He knew there was no way that they were ever going to expose the king of England to that kind of danger. Do you get it that King Jesus did the exact opposite of that? Rather than protecting his life, Jesus gave his life for you. He died for you and for your sins. He died for all the things you've ever done that have taken you away from him and all the things that you will do. See, King Jesus, his death in your place completely atones for all of it to everyone who calls Jesus king. Who's your king? What's keeping you from following that king? Let's pray. King Jesus, you gave your life for us. So this morning, we give our life back to you. We call you our king. Amazed that you would give everything so that we could live the life you meant for us to live. As we take this communion together, would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, work on our hearts? Would you come into our life and turn everything upside down that keeps us from you so that we can name you again King Jesus? Do your work. Amen.